The hills and moorlands around Lochwinnoch lie almost entirely on lava, resulting from volcanic eruptions 300 million years ago. The Ice Age influenced the shape of the hills, leaving in its wake a rocky, barren and frozen landscape. The subsequent development of vegetation culminated in the emergence of trees such as birch, hazel and Scots pine. In prehistoric times, the forest was cleared by early man in order that the land on the upper reaches of the River Calder could be used for grazing and the cultivation of crops. The Celts knew an awful lot about working with metals and jewellery and they had all the materials that they required there at the side and they built those wonderful roundhouses which can be seen, well the foundations can be seen way up in Muir Shield but you can also see a reconstruction of one they were highly civilised people, although they don't get the name of being that at all. But one thing they have left is the language. Many of the names round about are Celtic names. The name of our place Loch Winnoch, is, for example, the Calder, the Rivers. They were some of the early names round about and even the names of the farms were also Celtic. The River Calder drains the high ground and peat bogs to the northwest of the parish. It gathers pace as it winds its way across the moor. High above the banks of the Calder lie the ruins of the old Baritis mine. The first seed that confronted my father and I when we arrived at the old Muir Shield mine was the fact that the old men who had worked it before had only open casted the vein. Now the vein was a fair width so they would get a good amount of stuff. The sides, the hanging wall side was very, very friable and had collapsed into the gully that they had left. Now this was most unusual because we'd been in the habit of dealing with really solid hanging walls and it was the first indication we got that they might be troublesome. Now the idea in brightest mining is that you sink on the angle of the vein which is usually about 30 degrees off the vertical. This of course commits you to a skip wind, whereas if you went down vertically you could put in a cage which would be handy for men as well. So what it meant was that the further down you went, the further up the men had to climb up ladders because they were not allowed to travel in the skip. So it was in 1941 that we saw the old workings and we made our plans to reopen the mine. We went along like this through the valley and on this side here we had the hanging wall which had weathered away and the whole floor of the valley was covered with rubble. Then we decided here that we would go underground and to do this we put in roof supports across here and along so that we would be under out the elements. Now it was at this point here that we commenced to sink the shaft and the shaft went down and it went down at an angle of 30 degrees of the perpendicular of 90. Right? Now this was a skip wind, so up here inside we had to do an area where we could get the wheel in for winding up the skip and also the, this going into the winding engine itself that wound it up. Now the skip wind was of course like that 
and it went on two guides. The men had to climb up ladders from down the shaft and these had to be offset every 12 feet by the regulations so they just went 12 feet down and then they offset and continued on down. Now we were going down oh, about 120 feet at that point. Now from here we started to put out the mines where we were going to mine the brightest and here on this side we put in the pumps. Now the drill was that you went along here and then you took out a cut of brightest and you put it down onto here and you had these shoots and of course you had the bogies here and they came along to the skip where they were tipped in now after you did that you then had to come back and start and put in fill to hold the hanging wall so it's just rubble and of course the shoots had to be built up as you went up right now, once you got so far along, it was necessary to put a shaft right up for ventilation. We still had the problem of this very friable mixture between the hanging wall and the brightest. And as long as we left on about two feet of brightest in the hanging wall, it was safe enough. But nine times out of ten, this would break away and we would have this nasty situation. Now to give you an indication of the situation, perhaps I should draw something up here. And here we have, we're coming along the stope. And this is the hanging wall. And this is where the, the nasty stuff was. In between there and the real hanging wall. And the minute you broke through that, it eroded up and it left the seam of brightest lying exposed like that ready to come down so it was essential to keep the fill up onto the ore shoots which were of course extended as we, as we went along and underneath that is of course the main, main haulage The strange thing about this vein was that there were inside it what we called water pockets who were simply full of big lumps of brightness. Now this we reckon had been caused through water filtration and these were highly dangerous because once you ran into them you were looking up at a mass of interlocked blocks of brightness, which of course the average man in the mine was unable to attend to and this job fell to my father and myself and we took these down at great risk I may say and uh, however we managed to do it but there was also a big danger there of about a two inch layer of very brown soft clay and this held the brightest in a suction effect and without any warning at all it would suddenly release as the weight of brightest overcame the suction and this just came down with a real old clatter. Now anybody who was not aware of this, as we weren't aware of it at the time, but we realised once it came down, and it be good luck it happened during the night. Most falls and mines, of course, occur during the, the night hours and to early morning. So when we saw this, we realised that we had a real problem in this mine, and that we have to be ultra careful so that none of these men became injured or even killed. While my father and I were there, there was no men killed at all. Brightus is a very scarce mineral 
It's not found in many places in the British Isles and it's very valuable in the glazing of chocolate for all things. It glazes tiles. You go into a gent's place and you'll read uh, tiles that have not been glazed by the normal method, leadless glaze. It's also used in the manufacture of rubber. It's used to make barium meal for the folk who suffer from stomach and intestinal afflictions and here they, they drink it and it shows up very well in the x-rays. Uh, strangely enough, and much to my surprise, I learnt that it was also used in explosive and boosts the power to a tremendous effect over the usual salt and ammonium nitrate mixtures. But by and large, we, we managed along quite well. It was a very out of the way place and a real wilderness. I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it, but uh, we soon got accustomed, but we felt that we were isolated because we didn't have a telephone. And in the event of a serious accident, there was no way within reason that we could get help. However, we didn't require that while we were there. But shortly after that, yeah, a number of men began to get killed in the simplest of situations, something that would never have happened while we were there. But again, of course, yeah, this was lack of experience, not only in the manager, but all the rest of the men that were down there. So, at the end of the day, it became one of the most dangerous mines that we'd ever encountered. The one in Arden, of course, was ultra safe. We worked there for about 100 years and never killed anybody. But again, of course, these were different circumstances in the Muir Shield mine where we had this very bad hanging wall situation. Something that had to be watched. Didn't keep the fill up with the stoke. Then that's when it started to erode and cut away up into the brightest seam, leaving it just hanging in midair. So it was essential to keep up the fill and this was where the main occupation of half of the men was concerned because you could get plenty of brightest but getting the fill down was another matter and this we did by going up to the surface and putting another small shaft in where the fill could come down. But here again we had the added danger of working in a very wide open cavern well, the men were not too safe, so we adopted a new method and moved further down the valley and put in a decent shaft where we could put the fill down properly and in comfort. But uh, it was always a hazardous mine. It was, in fact, something that uh, most miners would have been very, very careful with. But again, the blokes didn't know, and that was how it all happened. The calder continues to wind its way across the landscape, escorted by imposing electricity pilots. These metal giants are a reminder of the 20th century life in an otherwise timeless scene of natural beauty. Water can be drawn from the river to supply the Came Dam by means of an underground pipe stretching some two to three miles. The Came Dam provides the water supply for Loch Winnoch, Came meaning comb or crest. Trout is the only game fish to be found in this dam. The first records of Muirshiel are actually of a farm, a farm which lent its name to Muirshiel. Muirshiel meaning simply a shieling on the moor, shieling being a summer farm. Later on, Queen Victoria set a trend for shooting lodges when she built Balmoral in 1855. The first records of Muirshiel are slightly later than that, in the early 1870s, but Muirshiel itself was just a, a shooting lodge, occupied originally during the summer, where people came to shoot game. Game in those days meant a bit more than just grouse. Things such as snipe and curlew, which aren't shot today, were shot. Muirshiel House later became occupied throughout the year and passed through a number of families 
mainly shipping families such as the Fletchers. Eventually it fell into disuse and was bought by the then Renfrew County Council who demolished it around about 1955. They planned, I think, to use the ground for water catchment and tree planting and some tree planting was carried out but in 1970 they opened Muirshield Country Park, the second country park in Scotland during European Conservation Year. Many of the paths and some of the clearing of things like rhododendron round about that time was done using local volunteers, a tradition which is still continued to this day. A ranger service was set up which provided guided walks and worked with local schools to provide educational visits either to the park or to schools. Well, the traditional woodland crafts can go back over 4,000 years or more. Some of the people that worked in the woodlands and the crafts they done, bodging was one, and the bodger made chair legs and a few spindles and the stretches, so he didn't do any other part of the chair except for the chair legs, and uh, a bodge job was an unfinished job unlike a botch job, which was a bad job. So uh, the bottom had made the chair seat, the uh, frame had put everything together, so it could be three, four, even five people involved in making a chair, but the budget specifically was the chair legs. Now, before we can use the pole lathe, there's certain series of uh, sequences you go through. First time you get your log of wood, which is freshly felled, so you're using green wood, lots of moisture content in it, so even though it's a hard wood, it's still quite soft. So the sequence of working with the wood is, you get your log of wood, cleave it down into sections, use a side axe, it could be right-handed axe or left-handed axe, to dress the wood off to give you a rough, a round shape, a, a rough cylinder shape. And then it goes on to the shave horse. Once the wood's been pared down by the, the side axe, we then put it onto this apparatus here, which is called a shave horse. And you'll notice it's a piece of wood here, more or less like a clamp, that we clamp the wood onto. It's got three legs, and the reason why it's got three legs is so that we can put it on uneven ground when the wood's been working within a wooded area. So, all we're doing now is just thinning off the wood, making it nice and round in preparation for putting it onto the pole lathe. And what I'm doing just now, as I'm doing this, I'm looking at the end of the wood to get a nice rounded finish at the end. So after the, the wood's been put onto the pole lathe, we can use uh, a few simple tools to um, turn the wood. Basically you need four chisels, a gouge, a flat chisel for planing, a skew chisel for doing your designs and a wee spindle gouge for doing wee concave uh, spin spindle work and such. And that's basically all the tools you need. A saw, an axe, a draw knife and four chisels and that's you. Away you go. From Heathfield or Old Muirshield, you come down the valley, passing an old farm called The Edge, a very fertile place even to this day, and you come down towards Clovenstone. Clovenstone is a lovely name for a, for a cottage or a farm. It is a very old building, this building. Uh, it dates from 1808, but I think there seems to have been a farm called Clovenstone on this site before then because it is listed in very old uh, Renfrewshire maps. People ask about the origin of the name, and of course the obvious answer is that a cloven stone is a cleft stone. And certainly 
there's a large boulder above the cottage that seems to be cracked or cleft and there's also a large boulder below the cottage which is cracked or cleft. So that may well be the origin of the name. But we have Lintill's farm across the Calder from here and this is cloven stone and lint of course was flax and there must have been flax growing uh, at one time and uh, presumably lint hills got its name from that and cloven stone seems to be some sort of uh, tool that was used in the, the uh, uh, manufacturing of the, the cloth from, from flax so perhaps that's an alternative answer to the name. As the Calder passes Clovenston, it undergoes a sudden change of character. From being an open moorland river, it flows into a deep gorge, unseen by the passerby. From Clovenstone we come further down the valley of the Calder to the little ferm tun, as they used to call it, of Tandle Muir. East Tandle Muir was called Conveth for a long time, and Conveth is another old name meaning that when the chief or chieftain or king or somebody in great power called you to give them hospitality. That was the meaning of conveys. The land on both sides of the collar is used almost entirely for hill sheep farming. Quinton McKellar has been sheep farming the area for over 60 years. I've just got uh, 96 ewes left now and uh, 25 hogs for replacement. I've now semi retired and into conservation. So the Countryside Commission Heather Generation Scheme is to regenerate Heather mostly. And one lot, 50% uh, of the sheep have been put off and there's an area down there which uh, they're, they're off completely from the 15th of April for three months from then on and it's not grazed at all. This I think is to let wildflowers and all sorts of things grow and preserve the riverbank that's what that comes under. And then replanted a hedge here which will be, I'm sure, the idea that will be to keep the birds, you know, make more hedging for wee birds and that, and wildlife, generally. Calder enjoys little rest between the waterfalls. Down the centuries, the rocks have been sculptured into strange, almost alien shapes.
Now we come to Meagle Cloak. It isn't the only cloak. Meagle, the big one. And it was there that Roland Muirhead stayed. Roland Muirhead was known to everybody as chiefly a great Scottish nationalist, although he had other strings to his bow to begin with. But we remember him being taken down to the station every day in a taxi driven by Jimmy Edgar. With all the farms of Cloak on its left bank and the Lint Hills on its right, the Calder runs into the glen. when the Calder was up to one of its funny tricks did a great deal of damage to this Calder Bank mill and it didn't really recover completely. However, the work went on for a while and some people said it was a blanket mill but it started off as a sort of bleach work and they bleached the material up on the hill and the, the gentleman who owned the mill stayed in Calder Bank House. I was never lucky so far as big fish were concerned, but as a boy you were always more or less guaranteed an 8 inch fish and they always seemed to be in great condition and it's many thanks to the gentleman who formed the club way back in 1927 and I can remember him well, the Gemmels, Jimmy and Andy and Willie McClure, John Young a relation of mine, Davy Andrew, he was a keen fisher. And these men, they stopped the river. And the tradition was to put 2,000 trout below the falls, 1,000 trout above the falls. And I'm standing in the cloak bun, and they stopped it as well, right up to the Boghead Dam. 
and it certainly as boys gave us some great fishing. I'll never forget the cloak burn. And an old uncle. Well, he took me up the cloak burn. And we tried the bog head dam. And after that, we moved down into the first pool in the cloak burn. And there was a run of water, we were fishing the worm. And I remember hooking this fish. I'll never forget it. It would be about maybe seven inches and a beautiful wee fish. And uh, we got it out, and Uncle said, well, it's a nice fish, but it's got to go back in. It's not near the limit, which was eight inches. So very reluctantly, it was de-hooked and placed back in. And that was the first rule I had to learn. You don't kill undersized fish. And... Uh, we fished our way down, got one or two smaller ones, but that really got me hooked in fishing. Whitton's Mill, another place we used to visit Occasionally, because it was kept rather private, but there were some good trout in the pool up there. And uh, it was fascinating to watch the mill wheel turning and all the weaving going on. For a long time, it was a corn mill. They did uh, carpet weaving for a while, I believe, but it was chiefly a corn mill and then finally it became a laundry and then it was nothing till Mr Whitten took over and started weaving beautiful blankets and plaids and scarves and material, beautiful tweed material. He was truly a craftsman. Balls in the Calder were made in 1787 in order to supply water for, first of all, the Calder Park Mill the next year, 1788, and the Calder Hall Mill in 1789. The water came down a lade which has now disappeared in the back gardens of the new housing complex up uh, near the bridge end. Bridge end uh, would at one time be a ford and then there was a bridge built when we're not quite sure, but it's mentioned in Paisley Abbey rental book and there was a bridge there in the 1400s, but that was the only way out of Loch Winnoch. You had to go up and cross at Bridge End, cross the Calder at Bridge End, and then go away along the road now where Glenlora is along that way to get to Kilburnie and Larks. Though no longer of economic value to the village of Lachwinnoch, the Calder continues to have an impact on the life of the inhabitants.
The recurring incidences of flooding continue to the present day. The Gaffle Burn, another favourite. Now it was a great wee place for boys, you could spend an afternoon there quite easily. And uh, there were always some nice trout in it, and the pool below it. Always little trout, but there always seemed to be fish. And the pools were lovely. All you needed was a little run of water, and you had a good afternoon's fishing. The river further down was a bit more difficult to fish. And as boys, we used to get hung up quite a lot trying to fish the fly. It was quite a problem. And it was no problem to the blacksmith's son, Billy Brown. Billy used to fish it from behind the smithy. And I remember once he got a beautiful trout, round about the three pound mark. It was a real beauty. And further down, I had a lucky day. Quite a heavy run of water. And I was fishing on my own, and I hooked an ice fish. And it was down at the bridge where the cycle track is now. And it's quite a stretch down into the river. And I was having an awful job getting this fish out. And I was almost sure I was going to lose it. When fortuitously, Jim Kerr appeared. And Jim saw the problem, so off his jacket, lay down in his stomach, stretched down, and I eased the line up, and he got a hold of the trout and got it out, and it was about a pound and a quarter, and I was really thrilled. It was one of the first big trout I'd ever caught in the calder. Although a relatively short river, perhaps no more than 8 miles in length, the Calder has revealed many different facets. Its lower reaches are in a state of continual change. The Calder picks up its last tributary, the Dibs, only a short distance before it enters the Castle Semple Loch. Castle Semple is one of the main gateways to Clyde Muirshoe Regional Park. At Castle Semple we have our land-based and our water-based activities, as well as more traditional ranger-led activities such as guided walks and talks. At Castle Semple we can offer a unique opportunity to participate in many different activities whether you be an individual or a group, whether you're coming for one of tasters in any activity or whether you intend to make up a programme of activity lasting as much as a week. On the land based side we have archery, mountain biking, orienteering, pioneering and hill walking and navigation. On the water base side we have sailing, canoeing, sailboarding and raft building. And you keep your fingers spread. Don't, don't. Our activities are run by qualified instructors up to national governing body standards. Sailing proves to be as popular as ever. We have many different types of craft available that are suitable for the absolute beginner to the more advanced racing sailor. With all active water sports there is an element of danger. We do our utmost to reduce this danger to an absolute minimum. This requires vigilance by the activity staff 
who are responsible for operating the rescue service. For the many visitors who don't wish to participate in the more active pursuits, there are some traditional countryside walks that can be taken in what can be best described as idyllic and natural settings. The Calder. From a dual source in the high bog moss, Calder waters flow, not gushing from a crystal spring, but filtering from the possets of the black peat pools, brown silk cool, coming slow from sly witch stirrings of rain smirrings. Cloud tears, mixed with earth, pressed and rest and eased over a thousand years from rotting fern trees of long forgotten forests. It lightens as it goes, quickens, gets merry, a sherry stream, chuckling, tickling stones, grown rounded by the perpetual fondling as it trickles over them beyond the dank marsh flows to the lower ground. Tributary veins rush down from Queen's side in the misty law. The trickle swells to an artery pulsing through the valley. Sometimes it tumbles down the limbs rumbustiously, roaring and laughing its waterfall din, glinting all white in its splashing. Then it swirls into the glen and settles deep between its rock ravine to sleep for a while under a Mona Lisa smile and dream its dark, dark dreams. At last the brown life blood of its heart and soul goes rolling past the village, bleeding into our loch of the wild fowl, feeding it sweet juices, vitamin silt from the hill, so that when the swans and geese and duck are blown in on a chill October breeze to forage in the muck, there's richness enough to winter them. <laughs>